It's, it's my privilege to um, introduce now Bill Potasnik. Um, we've known Bill for some time. He's a real thought leader um, in, the, in the private sector, if you will, um, you know, the not-for-profit hospital area. He's had a long and distinguished track, track record. Um, he's former head of the American Hospital Association Board of Trustees. He's a member of the Healthcare Forum. He's a uh, very entrepreneurial uh, hospital executive, which sometimes is an oxymoron. I've said this to Bill. Uh, entrepreneurial hospital executive, but he thinks differently about problems, just as Ken has thought differently about uh, problems. And, and that's what this country needs more of, people to think differently about solving a particular problem. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Bill. You know, Mike, I was, uh, I was thinking about your question about why is it so hard to run hospitals, and I was reminded of what um, one of our uh, illustrious presidents of one of our great universities said, and said, you know, it'd be great to be a university president if you didn't have to deal with faculty and students. <laughs> and I think those of us who run hospitals feel that same way sometimes. This is, these are great jobs <laughs> if we didn't have to deal with doctors and patients. But that's the name of the game here. But uh, Anyways, I'm, um, I'm very pleased to, um, uh, to be here. Uh, you'll see some overlap in terms of, of some of my remarks, but I, I think you'll see these will, t will tie together a little bit. Um, I am someone who's in the firing lines and uh, someone who kind of deals with the policy level of healthcare, as I'll talk about, but someone who every day is trying to figure this out and uh, continue to operate a, a, a very successful um, organization. Um, I'm going to be talking about the challenges of meeting the second curve. And throughout my remarks, I'll try to define what I mean by those sec by the second curve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you some personal perspectives on the challenges that we have today of running and meeting the needs of our patients. And do this from several perspectives. Uh, as someone who's been intimately involved in the health policy arena, uh, I'm going to try to translate what happens in the health policy arena to kind of the operational environment that we're all dealing with. Um, and there's going to be a fair amount of discussion about strategy because that's what we're dealing today. Um, and I think those organizations, frankly, that will be successful in the environment that, that Ken described will be those who understand strategy and can execute very effectively. Um, I tell people as I speak around the country that this actually is a great time to be in healthcare. And people kind of look at my colleagues look at me and you know we have this kind of beaten look for a variety of reasons. And and from my perspective as someone who's been in this field for almost 30, 35 years, this is, in fact, the most exciting time to be in healthcare because we have the opportunity to kind of reinvent ourselves. And that is a unique experience. Think, think of uh, colleagues that you have that are lawyers and business people and other things. Some of the same things they're dealing with are exactly what they dealt with 20 or 25 years ago. Now, let me just describe our, our health system so you have a, a sense of, of where I'm coming from. Um, as I went around the country uh, speaking, I used to tell people that um, we have a unique health system in that it is probably the only one in this country that has its origin based upon the brewery industry. And that is coming from Milwaukee, you think of beer and all of that. But we're named after, we have this funny little name called Freighter, which is hard to, hard to uh, articulate, let alone spell. Uh, Kurt Freighter was the founder and, and gave a substantial amount of money that created our, our system uh, back in the 1950s, and he came out of the, uh, out of the malt industry. He was the largest malt dealer in the world, um, and that's, again, a, kind of a unique experience in terms of describing that. We're kind of like a microcosm in that we have a health system that includes an academic medical center. We have a number of community hospitals. We have a large number of employed physicians. And by that I mean in terms of, of a microcosm, we've kind of sort of shadow what's going on in this country. From very large 
centers, the very small centers, and then the difficulty and the challenge that all of us have these days of employing physicians and making that model work. We're about a $1.5 billion a company. We're a double A minus uh, uh, health system, which means we have a solid balance sheet, which is, again, somewhat unique in today's um, world. Now, you'll notice that all of us tend to speak and we talk about, for some reason, use water as an analogy. And Ken and I did not kind of look at what each of us were going to talk about. Um, but water seems to be a predominant theme um, in, uh, in healthcare these days. Um, and I think part of what I'm, my theme is that we're all trying to search for tranquility. And what I keep telling our staff and our employee base and others that you know, unfortunately, tranquility is not part of the health arena these days. And the best way to kind of create a more tranquil environment is to be proactive, to think creatively, think out of the box, and develop strategies that are unique and different. Unfortunately, though, there's another great experience that we're all dealing with, and that is endurance. And if you haven't had a chance to read this book, it's a great explorer um, book about uh, the South Pole. And it really talks about trying to follow a map. And you can plan and try to anticipate everything. But we're all products of a very turbulent environment. And the climate changes. And the trick here is to figure out what's the scenarios and what do you have to do to survive in this environment. And so tranquility and endurance is sort of two opposite poles here, but those of you that are selling a product or consulting or whatever, and you talk to other fellow CEOs like myself, that's the world we're living in, in terms of great turbulence, great uncertainty, and yet we're also trying to figure out a point of tranquility to kind of continue to move forward. As I've said, I, I think this is a great time to be in healthcare. And part of that is the dynamics of the changes we're going through. Uh, I can think of no other industry right now that is going through such incredible turbulence. And out of that turbulence, in what is described here as creative destruction, is the opportunity to kind of reinvent ourselves and develop those kind of new tools that we're going to need to be successful and to create, truly create new business models whether it's ACOs or God knows what. The point here is creativity is going to be a prime ingredient for those institutions that make it and don't make it. You know, when I began as an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin in Madison many, many years ago, we had this big beginning. Uh, we all were assembled in the field house, and the president of the university came up. And his opening remarks were, I want you to turn to your right, turn to your left. One of you will not be here at the end of four years. And as a you know, young freshman, that was pretty, that was an intimidating statement. And we all left that room saying, well, damn it, it's not going to be me that's not here four years from now. That same analogy, that same statement is sort of what's going on in healthcare today. Turn to your right, turn to your left. Not everybody is going to make it. Not every hospital in this country is going to make it. Not every health system is going to make it. And those that make it are going to be those that use some of the technologies that we're going to be talking about and are not afraid to move forward and develop these new business models. Now, Ken described the national environment, and I'm not going to kind of duplicate that. Um, as chairman of the American Hospital Association, during the period in which we were actively engaged and lobbying and trying to shape health reform, it was an incredible, exhilarating experience. And as I now reflect back and I talk to the groups around the country, it always reminds me back of Clint Eastwood's movie, the, the Good, Bad, and the Ugly, because that's the only way to kind of describe what happened during that period. Uh, the good that came out of health reform was certainly the coverage in the beginning process of insurance reform. But kind of echoing what Ken has stated, health reform is not the beginning nor the end. It is merely chapter one. 
And what it began in this country is sort of accelerate trends that have already started and were starting. And what it does is create, again, this opportunity now to continue to move forward. Uh, I recently wrote an article in the Journal of Healthcare Management um, about the, the experiences coming out of the last couple of years and in terms of the health reform agenda. And the conclusion, frankly, that all of us have, if you get a group of, of CEOs around the table, is it isn't the law that matters. It's the opportunity now to, to move forward and take advantage of the focus that most of our organizations now have. Because, frankly, if you look at our strategies, many of them are very similar because we use your same service. If you're a consultant, um, which is a great boom industry these days, um, the issue here is going to be execution. And the challenges every day with regard to the environmental impact in terms of the reimbursement environment, and the reality is within our organizations right now, we need to figure out how do we do less for less, less reimbursement. In all of those discussions that, that I had and many of us had with every member of Congress, whether you were Republican or Democrat, the reality was no one was saying, you know, we want to figure out a way to pay you more. And there's a lot of rethinking right now in terms of, well, what did we get into in the health reform agenda? The reality that we tell is the cuts were coming. And what we were able to, frankly, get out of the health reform agenda was the beginning of addressing the coverage side. Now, these two things will never balance, but they do create kind of the reality of what we're doing today is not sustainable. And one of the key roles of the American Hospital Association uh, does, it acts as an, we're an advocacy organization. And so we talk, and the members come to us and say, well, why aren't you doing more to protect us? And we can up to a point, but the reality is what we're doing today is not sustainable. So you have to kind of move beyond that and start thinking out of the box here. The norm here that everybody now is working through is the notion that Medicare may be, and in many cases it is already, is our best source of payment, which is very frightening because for most organizations, including ourselves, it's a dramatic haircut in terms of reimbursement. You look at a small, medium-sized hospital, they're going to see their reimbursement changes go down about 14 to 15 percent. If you're a large community hospital, your, your reimbursements today are going to fall about 16 percent. And then the academic side, a lot of this depends on what happens in terms of underwriting graduate medical education and indirect medical education. In our own organization, you know, we're looking at cuts in the area of 20, 25, and 30 million dollars over the next few years, the next um, five to 10 years. Um, that's an eye opener. That's a wake up call. And it means that what we're doing today has to change. Now, when you talk about, you get a group again of, of CEOs together, we're all concerned about some of the same key challenges. Alignment is a key issue, and by alignment it means that how health systems and physicians work together is going to be key. I'm going to weave all this back into why IT is such a critical element in all of this, because key to these things in terms of all of these issues, it requires some new tools and new approaches. But alignment is absolutely key here because, again, those institutions that are able to kind of create the right incentives will be those that, again, continue to, um, to uh, uh, really thrive in the environment ahead. Now, one of the key difficulties we have right now is we're in a transitional period in that there is not an alignment of incentives in healthcare today. Most hospitals are reimbursed on a case base or on a DRG basis. Your physicians, on the other hand, are reimbursed on a fee-for-service system. Case rates mean doing less and staying within a set budget. Fee-for-service is productivity-oriented. 
And one of the difficulties and one of the challenges we have during this, we, we know the reimbursement systems are going to change. The problem is we don't know exactly when. And in fact, it would have been better for all of us. Still a big challenge. But in the Health Reform Act, it had said explicitly that by 2016, we're all going to get paid differently because we would have known what was the end game and what we needed to do in terms of executing strategy. The uncertainty that we all have right now in healthcare is not knowing how we're going to get paid in the long term. Yes, we're talking about bundle payments and capitated rates and whatever. But we're also talking about capitated payments in 1995, 1993-95. And I can remember some of those discussions we've had in meetings like this. It was an absolute certainty that by the year 2000, we were all going to be paid on a capitated basis. So today, we're still in that same game. And it does create some difficulties in terms of how do you move and how do you not. I think through all of these challenges, though, IT connectivity becomes the delineator. It is the key strategy element here, and it's the, street, the key tool here in terms of achieving the alignments that are going to be required, getting a handle on your cost structure, adjusting to these reimbursement changes, because as Mike said, what you, what you don't measure, you can't change. And the importance of empirical evidence and acting on empirical data becomes an absolute certainty. And then how do you do all of this? And how do you acquire the IT capabilities that are absolutely critical at a point where nobody has money? And capital access is going to be key. And in fact, what's going to start driving tremendous consolidation in healthcare is the access to capital. Healthcare is the most fragmented industry, and yet it accounts for a, a significant part of the GMP. And yet it is the most fragmented. And we all know in our suites today, we're all talking about alignment and growth to become bigger, to gain economies of scale, but it's about access to capital that really is driving this. Now, recently, the American Hospital Association put together a task force to try to say, well, could we provide some guidance to the field here with regard to what do we think the future is going to look like and what will the future health system look like? And what does it need to do to prepare itself for that? Uh, it's on the web. Uh, if you go to the AHA um, website right now, it was just re released about a month ago. And what it tried to do in that report was to try to look at all of these various forces, many of them which Ken described, and say, well, which of these are incredibly important and really need to have the focus that we need today which are those that we need to be aware of, and which are those that are coming down the road that we need to be thinking about. And we've talked about that, and it's a great list if you look at it. But what really what we're talking about is moving from what is today a very volume-driven environment to one in which it's based upon value as a determinant for reimbursement. And that's what's meant by the second curve. We're all operating today in the first curve environment. And yet, as organizations, we know we've got to move to that second curve to be successful. And a key part of all of that is the IT strategy that is a facilitator and a delineator and a critical component, because those health systems, frankly, that don't have the wherewithal to implement an IT strategy are never going to be able to move from the current first curve to the second curve. So all of our strategies these days, whether it is about accountable care organizations, which frankly nobody really has a clue what it is, to implementing other more sophisticated strategies based at population management, is about how do we move and prepare ourselves for that second curve. Again. These are some of the must-do strategies that everybody right now in the C-suite is thinking about in terms of, again, the word alignment is critical. The focus on quality and patient centricity is critical. The need here, number four, 
is the need for an integrated information strategy in a system. And then over here in the red, which I realize you can't see and we'll make copies of these available, are the core competencies. And at the bottom of the core competencies is the ability to utilize effectively your electronic data system to improve performance. You know, it's kind of interesting as I talk to people around the country, um, and many of us have spent vast, uh, literally millions of dollars on our IT strategies. Uh, if you're an Epic client as we are, you have spent millions of dollars uh, uh, in terms of implementing this. But if you haven't linked it to be able to use the data and converting it to patient registries and patient data systems, you, you aren't in a position yet to really impact the performance, which is quality improvement. And so people think about IT as sort of, well, we now have an electronic record, but it's insufficient because unless you're really utilizing it in a way to move the bar and incorporate it in your strategies to move that second curve, you'll have spent millions of dollars, but you still going back to me, turn to the right, turn to your left, one of you won't be here. It still doesn't guarantee the insurance that you'll be here as this environment unfolds. Now, in that report, and I, again, because of time, I'm not going to uh, uh, speak to it, but there's an important strategy lesson there with regard to what's needed, again, to move from the second curve, from the first curve to the second curve, and there was a lot of thought in that report with regard to developing integrated information systems and integrated alignment. And for us, it's a key issue um, in terms of this last bullet here. I've kind of laid out for you what I think, again, are, are sort of the key truths about information technology. Uh, Ken talked about that in terms of it's central to any of your strategies. It is critical to your strategy. Uh, one of the problems, frankly, that we had in implementing EPIC, kind of lessons learned, is we viewed EPIC, and this translate any IT system, as sort of this is the thing, it was an IT issue. And we found we couldn't move to the next level until we really integrated IT into our corporate strategy. And a lot of organizations still are kind of viewing this as an IT issue as opposed to an organizational issue. And that is an important mindset change that has to occur. The second part of this is the, the, the element of being able to get your cost structure under control here. If you're dealing, as we're now looking at, $30 million or so of less revenue, you've got to have a whole different way of doing business. It's not business as usual. And you can't achieve these efficiencies without data and being able to benchmark and create best practice standards and then evaluate yourself in that. And that comes back to, again, an IT system that allows you to kind of track that performance. And then what I see here is a critical element in what I'll describe in our own strategy is about clinical integration. Clinical integration is a term you're going to be hearing more and more about because it is the delineator in an ability to kind of move, to focus on quality, achieve those benchmark performance standards, and also consolidate your markets. Because again, I think the issue that a lot of us that are focusing in on is how do, how do we become a market consolidator? And you're going to be seeing in every state right now, in terms of a tremendous sense of consolidation going on, and that consolidation can only be achieved through um, clinical integration I'll come back to. Now, today's conference is, is to talk about meaningful use. And recently there was a report out that um, you know, really identified that we still have a long ways to go with regard to meaningful use. And in my term of meaningful use, isn't in terms of just the stages that are out there in the law. Meaningful use really becomes a key process in terms of recognizing and understanding that the environment's changing. 
And this isn't about trying to just ring the bell to get money from the feds that, as Mike mentioned, may not even be there. My definition of meaningful use, frankly, has nothing to do with what was in the stimulus bill. It's about taking these tools that are available, whether it's through the product that Netsphere is selling or Epic or whatever, and being able to utilize them. And those organizations that can take those tools, their IT tools, and use them in a meaningful way will again be those that are able to adapt and change to this environment. Now let me just touch on our own strategy, because again, I, I've said our system kind of is a microcosm of what a lot of health systems look like these days, from big hospitals to medium-sized hospitals to more rural hospitals, to dealing with physicians that were highly independent, and in fact, many of the physicians that we now interact with, if they thought they were going to be employees of a health system and said, you know, roll back the clock 10, 15 years ago and said you're going to be employed by the health system, that was their worst nightmare. And in fact, at a retreat we had a couple of, uh, about a year ago, um, we have just completed a major acquisition. And I opened my remarks by saying, you know, we're probably your worst nightmare. We're a health system that never wanted to employ physicians. And to be honest, you're a group of physicians that never wanted to be employed by a health system. But for whatever the reason, we've got to figure this out together because we can't exist independently of each other. And so a lot of part of what we're working through is alignment. And we also know that acquiring a physician practice does not guarantee alignment. Alignment really is focusing in on the right issues. And what we're trying to do with our physicians is focus in on that patient care experience and focus in on quality, focus in on patient safety, and give them the tools, again, through an IT capability to really look at and improve quality. Because what everybody really wants to do is to, again, improve the patient care experience. And unfortunately these days in healthcare systems around the country, or in meetings like this, we never use the term patient. And we have forgotten why we're here. We're not here to sell a product. We're here to meet the needs of our communities. And a lot of our strategies have to be built around population management, improving quality, and improving um, the outcomes of care being rendered. Now, clinical integration is a strategy, frankly, that is a term of the, F of the Federal Trade Commission. Because what a lot of us in healthcare find these days is we need to be able to link markets in a way that we never have in the past. You can do that through just acquisitions, and there are, large, there are a lot of large systems that have just have gone out over the last 10 years and have acquired everything that they could, physician groups, hospital groups. But frankly, there are a lot more of us that didn't have the financial wherewithal, nor were we dealing with partners who wanted to be acquired. And yet we recognize that in today's world, it's population management and it's the need to link markets. And the only way to do that is through a process that the Federal Trade Commission has laid out for us, which says even if you're an unrelated party, if you come together, around common quality metrics, you have an integrated IT solution, and at some point you're willing to assume risk for a defined population. You can be viewed as a single economic entity for contracting purposes. That's the essence of clinical integration, is to create, and in our case, in our state, it's linking various communities in a broader regional strategy with the ability to ultimately go to the market and function and connect markets as if we were one key organization. That's frankly part of the essence of an accountable care organization. We really don't use the term accountable care organizations. That's one of those nine words we use. What we're talking about is accountable care management. And to do that, we have to link markets. And frankly, this is going on throughout the country right now of systems coming together 
and trying to kind of create some common strategy. And the core of this, this cannot occur unless there's an IT strategy that links these markets. And that's part of the whole purpose of, of, of fostering a collaborative environment among doctors and physicians through this clinical strategy. So in our place, in our system, these are the various health systems that we're trying to link together. The essence of this, though, is to trying to create a common IT platform. And this is why my feeling is, well, Epic's a great product, and I'm not negating it or a, at all. In itself, it's insufficient because there's a strategy that's needed out here that is more cost effective and allows the ability to tie smaller markets together. And that's the issue that we're still searching for, is an IT strategy, and it may be open architecture, um, that allows, again, the connecting of the markets. That's going to be the biggest challenge in healthcare these days in this next, to get to that second wave, is connecting the markets. And what I define as sort of operating in the new math, because each of us, every health system today, is trying to focus in on how do we do populate, how do we prepare ourselves for population-based payment, which could be a new form of capitation or global payment. How do we engage our customers? And the technology is, is just starting. I, I carry an iPad. I frankly can't conceive right now of being able to function without it. It's a technology game changer. We need similar kinds of technology game changers to engage our customers because the issue under a changing reimbursement system is to keep people out of the hospital and to do it in a way that provides for care coordination, chronic disease management, which is in essence changing the technology side and then recognize that the compensation principles are that people want health outcomes, not merely health services. So again, we all like to go back to water in terms of kind of charting through these uncharted waters. I go back, again, to my story about being a freshman and saying and turning to the right and turning to the left and knowing that one of us isn't going to make it. Each of us today in healthcare want to make sure we make it and make it in a way that is meaningful and really has an impact on the day on the care we provide. So my concluding thoughts are, if you go to any corporate office right now, a corporate boardroom in healthcare these days, the topics are about scale and size. They're about geography and thinking in terms of broader ways and how do you connect markets. It's about integrating physicians in an effective alignment. It's about care, cost, and quality. It's about using these tools that we have, that we're still trying to understand how to use that in terms of effective IT strategies. And it's the ability to measure and act on empirical evidence. I had, uh, about three weeks ago, had an opportunity, I'm going to close here, to spend an evening with Jim Collins. How many of you know Jim Collins or have read his books? Good to great. Perhaps one of the most effective, one of the most interesting dynamic meetings I've ever been in. And he told the story um, of, he got very intrigued about two explorers back in the 1900s that were trying to get to the South Pole. One team made it and one team didn't. And he spent a fair amount of time researching what it was that, that allowed that team that made it to achieve that objective. And he concluded as he looked at the team that made it, what they did is they began recognizing the challenge over two years before. They planned for every conceivable scenario. They had a goal that said every day we needed to do 16 miles. That was their objective, every day be able to do 16 miles. And within that course, they were able to chart out their entire experiences to the point where they were literally began this journey. 
they were, they figured out they were 24 miles from the north, from the South Pole. They weren't sure if the other team had arrived there or not. But and the issue that they faced were, do we do the full 24 miles that day, or do we just do the 16 miles? And they elected to do, they said, no, our training is to do only 16, because we've conceived of, through our strategies, we've played out every scenario, and we know what's going to happen within that 16-mile period. If we go further than that, we're dealing with a whole set of variables we really don't know, and we haven't accounted for. The weather could change very quickly. His point back to us in terms of uh, those of us who are trying to run and navigate through healthcare organizations these days is we've got to have a very focused set of objectives. We need to do intense scenario planning. We need to have the ability to act on empirical data, and we have to narrow our risk. And that's the key challenge that everybody is kind of working through today. Thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. Yeah, it's 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 really cultural integration more than anything else. I mean, one of the beauties that we have in our health system, uh, we have an academic center, and we you know have all these bright young residents out there uh, coming out, and it's a natural. And then we have a lot of water buffaloes um, that are out there too that have been very great clinicians, but. Um, you know, aren't used to the kind of technology and may never adapt to it. Um, you know, I think simplicity becomes really key here. And unfortunately, a lot of the IT tools here are still very complicated. Um, you know, in many ways now, dealing with the iPad is a good scenario. Is we've, we've got to kind of great, get our systems, our IT systems down to a point of simplicity. And we're not there yet. I mean, Again, our own experience, Epic's a very powerful tool, but it's complex, and it has so many options that, and the biggest factor that physicians will tell you right now is they're under a, a tremendous time constraint because of, again, their own productivity issues, et cetera, and the technology is still too complex. So simplicity is still a key element. There are some, frankly, that, again, my turn to the right, turn to the left, that you just kind of have to do a lot of workarounds because you just got to kind of blow through that wave. And, you know, many of them are in my generation. Um, and you just can't spend the time and kind of work around them. The other piece here, though, is that a lot of the care that's going to be rendered in this country is not going to be by physicians. And there just are not. I mean, Ken talked about the manpower issue. There are just insufficient numbers. And it's going to be done in teams, care teams, um, that may have physicians. But a lot of the primary care, I, I believe, is going to be in hybrid teams, uh, non-physicians. And some of those non-physicians, frankly, are more adept in using technology um, than uh, the traditional model of care. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much.